Just take a moment, just where you're at. If you want to keep standing, go ahead. If you want to sit down, go ahead. But just in these moments, just reflect a little bit more. We've sung some beautiful songs about adoption, about love, worshiping the King. Father, we thank you that you're here. You, you come, you dwell in the place of worship. And we can sense your presence here. Your, your presence to heal. Your presence to break away some of the crusty old self that so grasped our hearts sometimes. And so God, we thank you for victory that we have in Christ. We thank you that we have strength in Christ to break off the power of sin. We have strength in Christ to push back against the darkness and not believe the lies that come. Thank you for the centrality of the cross and the love of God shown through Jesus' sacrifice and the great power of the gospel to set human beings free. And so God, I just pray that would just descend on us now as we just take a moment in this, just bask in this presence. God's people said, amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much, worship team. Also, I am grateful to Jesus that Ryan is healthy. I was expecting a call this morning because everybody in your family is, well, we won't go into the details. Yeah, not healthy. Anyway, I just thank you. It's been so good to work with you, Ryan. You're a blessing, man. And uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So come on over here. I'll, I'll back away a little so you can get what I have. And I want to pray for you. So thank you. I, I, Lord, I thank you for Ryan and for Patricia and their beautiful family. I thank you for Ryan's work among us here with our children's leaders, our youth leaders, and our compassion and justice ministry. Lord, not only that, but he's a good partner in ministry, who cares deeply about you and the things of God in people's lives. And I thank you, Lord, that you're working in his life constantly, and that he's seen great changes in his life, even this year, for your glory and for your kingdom's sake. And we just ask now, Father, that as he brings God's word, that you would bless him and bless the word that he teaches. May it be true to our hearts and minds through the power of the Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Kevin. It's been not half bad working with you. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> no. We... <laughs> I say that completely joking. No. <laughs> no. We are blessed as a church with our pastor. Amen. I have been... So encouraged and blessed um, by Kevin and his leadership and his partnership in the gospel and his care for me. Um, I just, I greatly appreciate that about you. Um, we had a time away at Lake Louise this past week at Pastor's Prayer Retreat and just an amazing time of encouragement in the Lord and in the Spirit and um, spending time with Patricia and I with Kevin and Cheryl and um, other friends from other pastors at um, Alliance Churches, and just a, a, an encouraging time. And the theme for that week was, there is more. And I love this concept, this idea of there is more. Um, as we look to Jesus, as we look at what he has for us, as we look at our experience of who he is, um, and our understanding of, of who he is, there is more. And you know, I love this because if you think about it, if we could fully understand or grasp all who he is, he really wouldn't be that great, would he? If we could really answer all the big questions we have of the universe, if we could understand all the intricacies of who he is and how he works and why he does the things he does, 
he wouldn't really be that great. He would be like us. But thankfully, he isn't like us. Thankfully, he is so much greater. And as we come to him, there is more. There is always more for us to experience of him. And so this morning, we are continuing and finishing off our series on the Holy Spirit. And the last couple of weeks, Pastor Kevin has led us through um, looking at different things about the Holy Spirit, the fruit of his presence. What, what does it look like when he shows up in our life? Looking at the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, um, that we find in Galatians. And then we looked at last week, the mission of the Spirit, what he's up to in the world, among his church, through his church, and how he gives us gifts to carry out that mission. And so this morning, what we're going to do to end things off is we're looking at this idea of being filled with the Spirit. What does it mean to be filled by the Spirit? What does that look like? Is it something that we ask for? Is it something that happens automatically? What does this look like in the life of the believer to be filled with the Spirit? There's a lot of ideas surrounding this out there. I'm sure if you went on YouTube and you just Googled filling of the Spirit, pastor's teaching on filling, you get all, any sort of teachings and all sorts of ideas on what this looks like. And I could stand up here and I could give you my ideas, um, but they wouldn't be worth much. Um, And so my prayer this morning is that we dive into the Word of God. He hasn't left us to figure this out on our own. He hasn't left us to take this concept and come up on our own minds of what do we think this could look like? Um, What do we want it to look like? Um, Because sometimes that isn't what it actually is or what are we afraid it could be like because we can have some fear maybe surrounding this. But what does Jesus teach us about what it means to be filled with the Spirit? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. And as you do that, let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that we thank you that your word is truth. We thank you that in you there is no lie, there is no deception. And we pray, Father, now that as we look to your word by your spirit, you would do what you promised to do, which is to lead us into all truth. By your spirit, would you open the eyes of our hearts so we can see and comprehend more and more of who you are. And we thank you that we aren't left to do this on our own, but you have given us your spirit. So we praise you and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So in Ephesians 5, verse 18, we are told this. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Don't get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery or wastefulness. But on the contrary, be filled with the Spirit. First thing I want to do is really kind of define what this is talking about here. What is Paul getting at here when he says, be filled with the Spirit? Well, first off, I think what we can say without a doubt is that Paul isn't talking about the indwelling of the Spirit in the life of the believer. He said, if we flip back a few chapters to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, we're told, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. As soon as we believe in Jesus... His spirit comes to live within us as a seal, as a guarantee of our salvation, our inheritance. And so I think it's really important to start here this morning because as we think about the filling of the spirit, um, as believers, I know I've been there before where I've thought, wow, do I, do I have the Holy Spirit? Have I missed out? Um, do I just kind of have him? Do I, am I looking for something else? After my salvation, after I believe in Jesus, do I have to do something else to get the Holy Spirit? I think we can lay that aside um, and not have to worry of, have I missed out on receiving the Holy Spirit? Because there's a lot in the Word about the Spirit, how how He encourages us, how He equips us, how He gives us His gifts, how um, He produces that fruit within us. And so we don't have to worry that somehow we're going to miss out on receiving the Holy Spirit. But we're told, no, as soon as we receive Jesus, as soon as we believe Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us.
so what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Because Paul goes in the same letter and he says, okay, you have the Holy Spirit. As soon as you believe in Jesus, you've been, you've been sealed by the Spirit. And then a few chapters later, he's telling us, now be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. I don't love English grammar, all of that, but sometimes it's really good to know and understand. I'm thankful that there's really smart people out there who are good at grammar and good at languages, um, like Greek, what what this book was originally written in, Ephesians. Um, And as we look at the breakdown of this, um, you know, it's it's like when we're telling our kids, um, I get in trouble with this sometimes, I'll be like, hey, do you want to come help me with this? No. It's like, oh, well, I wasn't really asking, but the way I said it, I was asking, and I said, oh, I gave you a choice. Um, um, But it's how we say something, the word usage, how we use it in a sentence matters. And so as we look at this, this I think this gives us a really good insight into what Paul is telling us here. Um, So we're going to have a little bit of an English lesson um, this morning on verbs and all of that. And so, um, like I said, I'm not great with this, but I'm going to do my best. The first thing that we see about this verb of being filled with the Spirit is that it's present. And what that means is that it's a process, and it's no assessment of the action's completeness. So it isn't something that's already been done, but it's something that is present, that's happening, that's ongoing. And so, again, Paul isn't here talking about that initial moment where we believe in Jesus, where we were sealed with the Holy Spirit, received the Holy Spirit. This is something that's ongoing in our lives. It's something that's continuing. The second thing we see is that it's passive. And what that means is that the subject, which is us, you, um, you and me, um, we are the recipients of this. So it's something that God does in us. You know, I think back to when the apostles are going and they're doing miracles and the man comes in and says, hey, can I buy some money for this? Can I pay you some money to receive the Holy Spirit? And no, 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 that's not how it works. This is something that God does in us. Be filled with the Holy Spirit is something that God does in our lives. But with that, it's, this verb is in the imperative, which means it's a command. It's a possibility. It's something that we are to pursue. So it's present, it's ongoing, it's active in our lives, and it's something that God does, but it's also something that we are called to pursue, that we play a role in. So as we, as we take a look at this idea of being filled with the Spirit, let's, number one, let's not fall into the lie or the worry that somehow we've missed out on the Spirit, that we have to go after Jesus and say, oh, hey, by the way, can I also have the Spirit? But that's something that He has sealed us with, which in reality makes this whole process of being filled with the Spirit possible. Because what we'll find as we look to Scripture, as we look to what Jesus teaches us about the Spirit, is that we are given the Spirit but we grow in the filling of the Spirit. We grow in the manifestation, the outworking of that reality of the Spirit living within us. So I have a question this morning for us is, do we want to be filled with the Spirit? Do you want to be filled with the Spirit? Do I want to be filled with the Spirit? And I don't want to move this past this too quickly because... I think if we're honest, sometimes we can get a little bit lazy. We want the the quick and easy way out. It's okay, I'm saved. I've got the Spirit. Now let me just ride things out comfortably until I get to go to heaven. We kind of want to have our cake and eat it too. We want salvation. We don't necessarily want the outworking of that salvation in our life. We like the idea that, oh, I've got the Spirit of God living within me. I love that. I don't necessarily want all the outworking because that might mean that I've got to change the way I'm living. That might mean that actually impacts my day-to-day life. As I said this past week at Prayer Retreat, the theme was, um, there is more. And I got home and 
Let me tell you, I'm like, okay, there's got to be more Jesus because I got home to sick kids, fighting dogs. We were stressed to the max and one kid after another. And then Patricia got sick and it's like, oh, life is hard. But we can convince ourselves so quickly and so easily that we can get by on our own, that other things can be used to fill us, to equip us, to encourage us through life. Remember what Paul said, do not get drunk with wine, for that's wastefulness, that's debauchery, but instead be filled with the Spirit. And this is what I would encourage us and challenge us with this morning is that life is hard, with or without God. You know, some people will ask, you know, why, why do you follow God if he doesn't make life easier? It's like, well, if I didn't have God, life would still be hard. I just wouldn't have him by my side. Um, but there's so many things that we can convince ourselves will ease the pain, will bring hope to a hopeless situation, that will give us strength, that will give us encouragement. But at the end of the day, none of these things actually give us what they promise. They don't actually fulfill what they promise for us to do. There's only one thing that will satisfy. There will, there's only one thing that will bring us hope in the hopeless situation. There's only one thing that will give us strength when everybody's sick, dogs are fighting. What's your struggle? What are you facing? Broken relationships, physical sickness, mental health issues, financial troubles, whatever it is, there is only one thing that will satisfy. And what we find as we look to Scripture is that it is through the filling of the Spirit, it is through our ever-growing experience of God that we are satisfied. We have to do is we got to go back to the beginning, all the way to the beginning, Genesis. We read in Genesis 1 and 2 the creation account. God creates the world. He creates everything in it. He creates humans, man and woman, as his image bearers, as those who bear the image of God in creation. They walked with him in the Garden of Eden. They knew him intimately. Then Genesis chapter 3, the serpent shows up, tempts Adam and Eve to eat the fruit of the tree that God said, don't eat that fruit, and they fall into temptation. But listen to what it says as, as God comes to them in the garden. This is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. It says, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees of the garden. Think about that. From a place of walking in perfect relationship, perfect communion with the God whose image they were created to bear, to hiding themselves from his presence. Shame is a horrible thing. It destroys us, it destroys relationships with one another, and it destroys that relationship between us and God. We see that sin's impact was this separation, this breaking of that relationship that Adam and Eve had with God, that, that relationship that we were meant to have with God. Sin came in and it destroyed it. We were made to walk with God. We were made to walk with him in his perfect creation, bearing his image. But sin destroyed that. It stole it. And you read the rest of Scripture, the rest of the Old Testament, you see this constant battle to get that back. Whether it's humans doing it on their own, the Tower of Babel, we're going to build this great tower to reach the heavens. 
You see it in the law, what God gave Moses. Try and get back to the presence of God, and they got close, but the closest they got was a high priest once a year going into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God. Sin drove a wedge. It destroyed that relationship between us and God. But thankfully, that isn't the end of the story. The gospel is that Jesus made a way. He made a way for that relationship to be restored, to be restored so that we could be redeemed. We could be adopted. As Julia shared earlier, we don't have to be afraid to be fully exposed before God. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to hide. We don't have to sow fig leaves. We don't have to hide any part of our life because Jesus paid for it all on the cross. And in him, we find salvation. In him, we find forgiveness and redemption. So what does this have to do with the filling of the Spirit? <laughs> Look with me the Gospel of John, chapter 14. Because you see, as we, as we think about the Gospel, as we think about the good news of what Jesus did, I want to challenge us in, I think, a thinking that we can easily slip into, which is this idea of Christian escapism. This idea of, I'm saved so that one day I get to go to heaven, and I'm just grinning and bearing it until that day. And Jesus is going to give me strength just to make it through the rest of my life so I can one day be with him. But church... The gospel is so much more. The gospel is so much greater than just this one day hope and we hope that we can grin and bear it and make it to that one day. But the gospel is a restoration of what sin broke. A restoration of that communion, that relationship with God that we were always meant to have but is now restored in Jesus. And this isn't just a future hope that we have. This isn't just a one day expectation but it is something that Jesus brings to us now. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. It says, Let not your hearts be, trouble, be troubled. Believe in me. Believe, you believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I would not have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may also be. Okay. I will be honest, for the majority of my life, I've always looked at this in terms of one day future. Jesus is going back to the Father's side, and one day in the future, he's going to come back to take us to be with him. But I was challenged um, this past spring in one of my classes, look at the context. What, what's going on here? What is, what's surrounding this passage? Because this isn't when Jesus is about to ascend and go to heaven. That's recorded as well later on. And Jesus has things to say to his followers when he's about to go back to the Father's side. But what's going on here? This is leading up to the cross. This is leading to his death. Let not your hearts be troubled um, Peter has just been told that he's about to deny Jesus three times before the rooster crows. His disciples have just been told by Jesus, you can't follow me yet. But don't let your hearts be troubled because things are about to change. Don't let your hearts be troubled In my Father's house are many rooms. Again, we look at English and grammar. This was a challenge for me this week. Word usage, it's important. What is Jesus saying here? In my Father's house, there are many rooms or dwelling places. In my Father's presence, there are many places to dwell. And I'm going to prepare a way for you to get there. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to bring you to that place in my Father's presence. 
Okay. So he's going to prepare a place and he's going to come and he's going to take us to himself. He's going to take us to the Father's presence. He says, you know the way, and um, one of his disciples, Thomas, says, "Um, we don't know where you're going. How are we supposed to get there? Um, Jesus says, one of the well-known verses, um, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is saying, okay, I'm going to prepare a place. I'm providing a way, and I am that way. I'm that way to the Father's presence. He goes on, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So Jesus is the way to the Father. Jesus also is the manifestation of the revelation of the Father. You guys catch that? He said, I'm providing a way. I am the way. If you had known me, you'd know the Father, and you will know the Father because you have known me. Do you see that Jesus acts as both the bridge to the Father as well as the revelation, the perfect revelation of the Father to his, to his disciples? Philip, another one of his disciples, asked a question, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And it's like, Philip, like you've been with Jesus for three years. Haven't you seen what's going on? But then I think, okay, I've um, been a Christian for how many years and I still doubt sometimes. Um, So let's not give Philip too hard of a time here. Show us the Father. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on accounts of the works themselves. So Jesus is trying to get through to his disciples here. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. There isn't, you know, as we think about the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it isn't that these are three distinct separate beings. We have to remember our theology here of the Trinity is one God and three persons. Jesus is doing a little Bible lesson here for his followers. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father is in me and I am in the Father. Jesus isn't some less than. When we say that God is fully God, or sorry, that Jesus is fully God and fully man, we aren't saying that he's half God and half man. Jesus is saying you haven't, gotten a second-class God here. You haven't been walking with some partial God here as I've been on the earth. But no, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son If you ask me anything in my name, I will do that. So Jesus has just said a lot in these these few sentences to his followers. I'm making a way for you to dwell with the Father. I'm going to prepare a place, and I am the way, so that you can be in the presence of God. You can dwell with God. And I'm making a way that you can do the works that I've done. And he, it was a bold statement here. Anything you ask in my name, I will do. And in verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. The section break there is at an unfortunate spot, I think. Because Jesus is saying... When you know my Father, when you see my Father, when you're dwelling in his presence, two things are going to happen. You're going to do the works that I've done and greater works. You're going to keep my commandments. It's going to be this total life transformation that happens when we come to see Jesus, come to know and believe in Jesus. But how does this happen? 
How can we ever expect for this total life transformation to happen in us? Well, Jesus keeps going. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. The parakletos, the Holy Spirit, brings the presence of Christ to dwell within us. This is huge, church. This is massive. This isn't Jesus saying, I'm going to give you strength to make it through the rest of your life so then one day when you die, you can be in the presence of God. But Jesus is saying, I am bringing the presence of God to dwell in you. Just as Jesus said, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. He's saying, now we're in you. By the Spirit, the presence of Christ, which is the perfect revelation of the Father, comes to dwell within the followers of Christ. Judas asks, Judas, not Iscariot, asks him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Make our home. It's a word that's used by John twice. And the first time was rooms in the beginning of this chapter. In my father's house are many rooms. And then Jesus says, we will come to him and make our home with him. You see, all of scripture we look at has been this fight to get to the presence of God. This, in our own strength, if I follow these rules, can I? And God is saying, you can't do it on your own. Here's the law. Try it if you want. He knows we can't do it on our own. He knows that if we're left with a list of rules, we're going to break them within day one. We're not going to make it. And the gospel is that Jesus doesn't say, okay, I've given you a little bit more strength. See if you can do it this time. The gospel, what Jesus did, how he made a way was he brought the dwelling place of God to be within those who would believe and trust in him. This is that restoration of what sin took away from us. We were made to walk with God, to be in his presence. That is the very foundation of who we are. In Christ, that identity is restored. This is the how of that first section of how are we going to dwell with the Father? How are we in any way going to make it to the presence of the Father? And Jesus says, I've got this. I'm going to prepare a way. I'm going to prepare a place because by my Father's side, in my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. There's not a lack. There's not a limit. There's not, oh, there's a certain number and you're cut off. No. There's plenty of space. And when we believe, when we trust in Jesus, he brings that dwelling place to live within us. This is really a miraculous thing. We don't have to go to church. We don't have to go to a building. We don't have to go to a tabernacle or a temple and hope that they get the sacrifices right or hope that they burn the right incest for us to be able to be brought into the presence of God. 
But through what Jesus did on the cross, the presence of God comes to dwell within us. And in that bold statement of doing the works of Jesus, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. It's back at um, verse 13 and 14. Doing the works of Christ. Here's what I want to challenge us with this morning. And this is where I think, you know, we're talking about the filling of the Holy Spirit, and I promise we're going to get there. We're getting there. You see, we have the Holy Spirit living within us. The dwelling place of God. God is now dwelling inside of every person who believes and trusts in Jesus. We have him dwelling inside of us. But is that working itself out into our lives? You see, in John, he talks a lot in these, these circles. And we saw that in, in Revelation. Um, this, um, I, wanna, I keep wanting to say circular reasoning, but that's not good because that's actually not. <laughs> um, but this, this idea of, you know, we think very linearly in our, in our modern age. But I think about this circular theory of abiding in God, God abiding in us, abiding in his love, leading to obedience, leading to the outworking of um, these works of Jesus in our lives. But the question is, how deeply are we abiding in him? How deeply is this salvation working itself out in our lives? We've been given the spirit. He dwells within us. But there's also this call, this command, abide in me. You see, John goes on, he's talked about this reality of the Spirit dwelling inside of us. And then in chapter 15, verse 1, he he goes into this, this analogy of a vine. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Abiding in Christ. The branch bears the fruit of the vine it's connected to. You have a grapevine. It produces grapes. If that branch is cut off, it doesn't produce fruit. If that vine is, or sorry, if that branch is connected to that vine, it begins bearing fruit. And what does a gardener do? He prunes it. Um, we had a, a big garden back in the Okanagan when we lived there and had these cherry tomato plants that I guess the soil was really good for tomatoes there because these plants took off and they had shoots going all throughout the garden. It was utter chaos. For it to effectively produce fruit that wasn't just going to fall and get rotten on the ground, I had to prune this sucker It was massive. I had to cut off branches here. I had to prune and make sure that it actually was doing its job of producing good fruit. If you have fruit trees, you know you cut off bits and pieces and those fruit trees can look pretty scraggly when it's done, but you know it's done so they produce more fruit. They become more fruitful. Church, this isn't a disconnected thought. I want us to see this here, is that this idea of abiding in Christ, of bearing fruit, this isn't disconnected from what Jesus has been talking about all along. As we read through, as we read through this idea that Jesus has made a way for us to be back, into the pre- be back in the presence of God, for the dwelling place of God to be within us, for his spirit to be placed within us, 
saying, now abide. Go deeper. God's got work to do. He's going to be pruning you so that you can bear more fruit. As we think about this idea of being filled with the Spirit, but experiencing more of Him, I think it's important we go back to what Jesus first said about the purpose of the Spirit, what the Spirit is all about. The Spirit is all about us knowing Him. It's about us getting back to that place of walking walking intimately in fellowship with the God we were created to know. And He makes that possible when we trust in Him, His Spirit comes to live within us. And we experience that more and more and more as we abide in him, as we press in more into him. And so the filling of the spirit, yeah, there's other fruit that comes with that, absolutely. There's gifts that come with that. But the purpose, what we pursue, what we seek after is to know him more. We say, yes, I want to abide in Christ. I want to be filled with more of his spirit, filled continually day in and day after, day in and day out because I need him. Because I look at life around me, I look how frail and inadequate I am. I look at how frail and inadequate this world is. And I say, yeah, there's got to be more. And Jesus, I know that there is more. So I go back to that question of, do you want to be filled with the Spirit? We can get by, maybe. Ride out this life till the bitter end. Pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. Grin and bear it. Just try to make it through. but the gospel is so much greater than that. The gospel is so much better than that. We have the amazing privilege, grace, to have the presence of God in us. And so often we forget that. Maybe not up here, but practically. We get frustrated. We get focused on what we're doing and we forget. We even get focused in doing good things. But we forget. Jesus says, abide in him for apart from him we can do nothing. Our purpose, the reason for existing is to know him. We were made to bear his image. And he has has made a way for that to be possible again. And so, so I challenge us. Day in and day out, are we seeking to be filled with his spirit? It's easy to make this something that it's not. It's easy to have different ideas about what this should look like and and honestly sometimes make a spectacle of it. But this is knowing Jesus. It's getting to know him more. As Pastor Kevin shared last week, sometimes we can get afraid we can wonder like, oh, if the spirit breaks out, are things going to get weird? Is, you know, is it going to get a little too crazy? Like, what, what's going to happen if, if we all start praying, you know, fill us with your spirit? Like, what's, what's going to happen? Here's what's going to happen. We're going to know Christ more. <laughs> We're going to know him more. 
And so I want to end this morning with just a little bit of time of us praying, Jesus, fill me with more of your spirit. It'd be wrong of me, though, to not first ask, do you know Jesus? Because being filled with the Spirit, getting to know Him, it it implies the reality that we have the Spirit, and um, we don't have God living in us if we have not first believed in Jesus. And so if you're here this morning and you have never put your faith in Jesus, if you've never said, Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner, I admit that I've gone the wrong way. I admit that I've messed up. I've walked away from you. But I'm trusting in what you did on the cross. I'm trusting that you died for my sins. I'm trusting that you then rose from the dead victorious and that you offer me forgiveness. I encourage you to do that now. Believe in Jesus. Trust what he did for you. And then we pray every day, Jesus, I want more, more of you. We pray, fill me with your spirit more and more so that I can know you. So I can be so filled with you that I'm in such intimate relationship with you that I hear your voice, that when I pray, When I ask, it is in your name. It is according to your will and your purposes and your character. So that I can have that confidence that as I press into you, as I abide more and more in you, fruit will be produced. And so Jesus, right now we ask, based solely and completely on your finished work on the cross. We ask for more of you. We're not looking for a spectacle. We aren't looking for anything that makes us look good, anything that makes us look super spiritual or whatever we might think, but we are seeking more of you, Jesus to know you more, to abide more deeply in you, in your love, to have lives transformed so that that when others see us, they see you. That when others see the fruit being produced, they see you. Thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness. We thank you for your truth. We thank you that you have not left us as orphans. You have not left us alone. You have come to us. When we couldn't make it to you, you came to us. You made a way for us to dwell with you, and we thank you and we praise you for that. And he asked, Father, that we would find encouragement in this, that we would be challenged by this, that as we seek to know you more, as we seek to be filled by your Spirit, to be continually day in, day, day in and day out filled with your Spirit, that we would see this isn't a burden. This isn't something that maybe we'll miss out on, but it's something that you have provided, that you've promised. I pray that we would be a people transformed because we know Jesus. That when people see us, they hear our words, they see our works, our actions, that they would say, these people know Jesus. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
That's the worship team to come. The Spirit and the Bride say come. The Spirit and the Bride say come. And let him who hears say come. And drink of the water of life. The Spirit and the Bride say come. The Spirit and the Bride say come. Let him who hears say come And drink of the water of life Whoever thirsty Let him come Whoever wishes Let him drink The water that God Freely offers to all Whoever thirsty end with this from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus says, What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We don't have to worry. Am I going to miss out? Am I going to do this wrong? Am I going to say the right thing or the wrong thing? How much more will the Father who is in heaven, our Father, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And so I pray you've been encouraged this morning. Press into him, abide in him, trust in him. There's always more. And so, Father, we thank you. 
We thank you that we can, we thank you that you came to us. Because if it was left up to us to make it to you, there's no way it would have happened. We thank you for what you did on the cross and making a way. We just want more of you, Jesus. More of you and less of us. So we praise you and we thank you for that gift. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed week. If you'd like prayer, um, we'd love to pray with you up front. You can come forward. Um, Yeah.